Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. Sunday, uh, June 13th, 2021. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. Oh, and that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. And welcome to Cubs Out Loud, the Bear Podcast for Determinant Length, episode number uh, 604. I'm sorry, but... Uh, I don't Howard. brew the tea, I just serve it. But instead, we have... Uh, Edward Angelini Cook! Yay! Hi! We should get you a clip, Ed. We should get you a little soundy clip. Yeah. You, oh, you're that would be show. fun. You're on the show so often, you know, just having it there for when you do, when you, you appear. That would be awesome. A wild Edward has appeared. A wild Edward has appeared. That's That would be great. <laughs> It has to be something sex related. Um, how about Miss Dress from Leslie Wand? Makes me want a hot dog real bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's from Legally Blonde too. Uh, oh, oh, I got checked. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and I was actually playing the let's talk about sex uh, uh, sounder a couple of times, and I realized, oh yeah, I'd stop sure and sound anyways we're done. way to oh, go Jeff. so gary it's another landscape of relationships i'm sorry i totally forgot what it was we we're talking about specifically <laughs> ed for a future episode i would like to talk us about partners who do puns and how annoying they are oh my goodness Okay. <laughs> Apparently, I'm Gary's partner now. In in this in this hobby of a relationship, yes. Hmm. Anyways, yeah. So Ed is back. Welcome back. It's been a month. We're happy to see you again. Oh, how 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 has it only been a month? You know, it's only it, we're on a cycle. It's every four weeks, but every twenty eight days. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that time in the month again have to have edward on we don't have to have him on we pre-schedule it and he enjoys being here don't you ed i love it i was say awkwardly putting him in the hot seat with that question uh-huh. <laughs> but um no but uh seriously so we have been doing the LOR, the Landscape of Relationship series, for a while now. And actually, Ed, you were the one that um, has pretty much contributed, I think, almost all of the topics as far as like the, the title and the, and the focus. So um, this one, we switched up the title. So for those of you that happen to follow our Google Calendar, ding, you would have noticed that today's show title changed on you. But it's still the same thing. Calendar dash C O L. So, uh, yeah, I guess we could say that we apologize for the title change, but that would also be a bad pun. (laughs) (laughs) See, now it's infectious. Smooth, really smooth. You wash it off of me. Anyways, so, uh, yeah, the first of all, we should kind of discuss the the awkwardness of the moment. (laughs) It's not really that awkward, but um, Mr. Damon is on a well-deserved vacation. He hasn't actually been away from COL for a while, uh, but he is celebrating an anniversary with his Aww. partner at gym. Um, so, yeah. Yay. In fact, um, if I recall correctly, 
Hang on a second. I'll quote the number because I'm pretty 13, sure 16? it's a teen. I know that. And I'm debating on whether or not the teen is. I yes, remember the teen 15. is. Well, it's 18. Okay. So they have been together long enough to have had a child that is now an adult. So. Oh. Congrats to Damon and Jim. So, yeah, they are. They're celebrating an anniversary, having a, having a day. So we're happy for them. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, so he's not here today. But Ed has joined us uh, because it is obviously landscape for relationships and our resident sex therapist, our certified. And what stage are you now in your in your educational pursuit? So I'm not I'm not a certified sex therapist yet. I'm almost oh. there. Uh, but, uh, this past month I reached my, so I'm now a doctoral candidate, no longer a doctoral student. So I passed my dissertation proposal defense. So now you prepare your dissertation? Yeah. Now I get to, um, get my study, get my data and then write up the results and then defend it and then i'll then i'll be a doctor so you do all the preparation in the workroom then you present yourself mm-hmm. in front of a panel of judges and you get critiqued and you get to find out whether you sashay away or not yeah <laughs> yeah so <laughs> they have said that shante you can stay for right now <laughs> for now nice so that being the case uh yeah congrats on making one more step now from what I know of people who have pursued a uh, doctoral, uh, I guess, titlement and, and education level, this could be a lengthy step, correct? Um, I mean, I hope to be done by next April. Um, okay. So, you know, um, the hard part is over. Um, I've written three chapters so far. Now I just have to write two more. Okay. So it's not like the next time we talk to you, you'll suddenly be a doctor. It doesn't work that fast. No, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Good. I, I will have well, to say that we've had one of our guests uh, during the time that he has guested on, on our show has gone from not being a doctor to being a doctor. A uh, different correct. field of, of expertise. But still. So, th- so hopefully soon or at least by sometime next year, uh, you will be your our second. Yay! And we'll Correct. actually be able to correctly title you as Doctor. Hopefully, there you go. If everything goes well. Yes, so you'll be joining Doctor Cisco uh, Salgado, and I do have a theory of a subject in which both of you would be on. And now, part of me is tempted to wait until you are a doctor, so then we could have two doctors. At mm-hmm. once, because who doesn't like to have two doctors at the same time? <laughs> Anyways, That's true. That being said, uh, in the landscape of joke. <laughs> what? <laughs> I was making another pun. You should apologize uh, for that joke. I'm sure. Okay. So anyway, pre- <laughs> previously this year, um, Ed has been on, and we talked about. Um, for the landscape of relationships, I should say, in the series, we did a two-parter about trust. And then last month we had him on and we talked about friends with benefits, FWBs. That was fun. <laughs> I'm glad that you liked it. Um, so now we're going to go from a fun subject to maybe a not-so-fun subject? Question mark? Uh, I don't know. I think our subject is can be very transformative. And healing. Mm-hmm. I'm not hearing fun. I'm hearing transformative, but I'm, <laughs> I'm hearing like healing. I'm not. I'm not hearing fun. I'm not hearing. Uh, yeah, like it. Like, yeah, not ecstatic. This isn't like a. Yeah, th- this can be a difficult topic. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about apologies because when you're in a relationship with another person or persons, um. There will be times that you may have to acknowledge things that maybe were not, uh, that did not go the way intended, Um, misspoke, um, took an incorrect action, 
harmed another individual maybe um so we're going to kind of get into that so i guess the first thing we need to kind of flesh out ed is what is an apology which for the record i think there are multiple definitions but sure um but you know just for the uh for you know what we're talking about an apology is going to refer to a regretful acknowledgement of an offense or failure um, and the reason why I made this the sudden switcheroo is um, I was I had thought we were we were talking about apologies and uh, and then I was like oh wait forgiveness well we have to talk about f- apologies before we talk about forgiveness um, mm. okay <laughs> so I feel like this would be a good precursor um, if we wanted to talk about forgiveness um, at another time okay. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, so with that definition, would everybody agree with that? Like what are, what are other people's ideas of what an apology is or can be? Uh, I think that's a very succinct and, and precise, uh, uh, uh definition, honestly. I because, find it in, tr- go ahead. Ed. Because it, I, I think of it as being so precise and concise. Wow. Um, which is probably me double meaning anyways um, mainly because it can be of so many levels because if like you're working with somebody in the kitchen you open a cupboard door and accidentally hit him in the head with the cupboard door and you go oh my god I'm sorry that's an apology but it's like really slight sort of apology you know and everything but then there can be a more dramatic more hurtful situation uh emotionally speaking uh, in addition to being something of causing physical pain <laughs> um uh, where you need to apologize or need to do more heartfelt apologies so there's this various range between the two but in essence the of what an apology is that's essentially what it is so you, either you're regretful for a big thing that happened or regretful for a small thing that happened. Like you accidentally get them in the head with a, a, a cabinet door or hurt them emotionally in some ways. I think it's interesting that regretful is a key word in this definition that you gave, Ed. Because mm-hmm. I find a lot of people will call out others saying that's not an apology because I think what what is happening is someone acknowledges an offense or failure, but they're not regretful about it. So you get, mm-hmm. you get twisted. I don't want to say twisted. You get responses or postings that are like, well, you might feel genuine. This doesn't feel like an apology, you know? Yeah. We're, we're definitely going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about the non-apology um, and we're going to talk about what, you know, the ingredients of a, you know, a heartfelt apology um, and what kind of can go into that and what probably shouldn't go into that. So we'll probably I'm going to guess we're going to get into this later. But one of the things I've heard recently as far as a definition of apologizing specifically as, a, as an action is to course correct the behavior that led to the offense. Or the failure, like to show that you are genuinely regretful with an intent to improve. Mm-hmm. We will definitely get into that too. Okay. And we're also going to talk about, uh, so we're going to talk about the process of an apology, um, the ingredients that go into it. We're also going to talk about when we're the one who has to apologize, like on the spot, like when we're responding to say some, some criticism, which can be really hard. Uh, so uh, we're going to kind of go through the steps of that and then also talk about uh, what happens or why people don't apologize. What could be co- possibly going on for them? Uh, so that is something that we may have to, deal with on our own um because that can be really hard right like how many times have has something happened when we haven't received the apology that we're deserved um and how do we move on from that Mm. okay 
sounds like we have a lot to cover. So why don't we get started? Yeah, I think that's a really good idea, Gary. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, so when we're talking about apologizing, one of the important names that comes up is Dr. Harriet Lerner. Uh, she is a psychologist, and she wrote a uh, book in 2017 called Why Don't You Apologize? Healing Big Betrayals and Everyday Hurts. Uh, she has a TED Talk, um, which was a TED Talk of Kansas City, I believe, um, where she talks about uh, the process of apologizing and some of the things that she uh, mentioned in this TED Talk are that uh, when we don't get an apology that we deserve, it can crack the foundation of a relationship. And regardless of the situation, what, what Jeff talked about was really spot on that, uh, you know, sometimes apologies can be, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I went to the store and I didn't get what I needed to or but sometimes it could be a really big hurt uh, that we have to apologize for. Regardless of the situation, the rules of apologies are always going to be the same. So basically, the process of an apology is to, of course, first, say you're sorry, say what you're sorry for. Um, uh, Dr. Lerner also says that the two, uh, two of the most important words in the English language are I'm sorry. Uh, and then next is to acknowledge the damage that was caused. So I'm sorry for, you know, uh, third is to resist the temptation to say, but which we will get into. And then finally, take responsibility for your actions. Um, there is a potential fifth. Um, if you if anybody here has uh, read the book, The Five Languages of Apologies, forgiveness is or ask for forgiveness is a potential fifth step to this process. However, I want to cut it off at fourth, uh, four, because forgiveness is not always a, a step in this process. Um, so what do we think about that process? Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? Yes, Gary. Um, I've, moved in a different direction in regards to the first step say you're sorry because in i'm going to say this in american western culture in the past decade we went through a whole period where the messaging that i was receiving which i agreed and adopted was that sorry lost its power that it was used too frequently and like so when people would say i'm sorry it's like it doesn't feel regretful, like it doesn't have any weight to it. And so the language proposed was to say, I apologize, which has more ownership to it than to say, I am sorry. Because I think a little bit of what you're describing for is that keyword for like, I'm a I, I'm sorry for. Um, and obviously, you would also do that with apologize. But I'm curious to know what you think about that. Like if if you have an opinion on that or if you think it's it's kind of a potato potato like it's just a word yeah i mean i uh i think there's a lot of different uh isn't there isn't there a song about uh like so many different ways to say i'm sorry or something yeah i think that's actually the title of the song yeah i think so anyway yeah, well, um <laughs> but the the yeah, I, I also would agree with that. I think that culturally, um, we get a lot of I'm sorry, period. Um, or what what uh, also recently we have heard is I'm uh, I'm sorry, not sorry. Mm, yeah. Sorry, not sorry or whatever. Um, so I think that the word sorry has um, lost its impact. However, it can also be impactful given the context, the tone, the intentionality behind those words. So we can also say, I apologize, I regret. There is a lot of different words that can get to that same meaning. Um, but I'm sorry if given genuine, uh, couched within a uh, the ingredients of a impactful apology can be can be helpful. But I hear you, right? Like there are a lot of different words that we can use other than I'm sorry. I like I apologize personally. 
Jeff, what about you? I I really think it. Yeah, I I kind of kind of agree with the overuse of I'm sorry. But I also think that I'm sorry and I apologize have different two different um or two different levels of of an apology to me. Like when I accidentally hit somebody in the head with with the cabinet door and it's like an immediate like oh my god i'm sorry that that that's a perfectly fine place to put it it's kind of like a, a quick quick and dirty apology which for most people it, it, it's not gonna it's it's the level of of what happened isn't as big as like an emotional hurt when it's something you need to be more heartfelt more it's more severe that's why i think you need to essentially formalize the apology by saying i apologize for so right, i think it's kind of like no, i really think it's formality sort of thing like sorry should be a very casual quick and dirty one while apology feels more uh authentic in a uh, a, a more formal way um, I find that if somebody's trying to use I apologize in the I'm sorry sort of way I feel like they're trying to I, I feel like it's not it's not heartfelt <laughs> sure so almost like uh, like they could be overdoing it like they, they almost like sarcasm sort of like sure, sure I yeah I apologize that I hurt you so <laughs> I hear that. And, you know, we're actually going to, um, that, that's kind of coming up. Um, but there's also something else to consider is, uh, to what Gary was talking about and what, and, and Jeff, what you were talking about too, the kind of overusing of, of I'm sorry, um, is gendered, uh, which we will also get to as well. Um, and, uh, so that's also something that's really interesting if, you know, just to give a little preview, uh, you know, I will tell a lot of my, um, my women, the, the women that I see to not, to, I always tell them to be mindful about how many times they're saying, I'm sorry. And to recognize that they're probably saying, I'm sorry for things that they don't need to apologize for. Interesting. Mm -hmm. which we'll get to but um but i wanted to kind of go over what uh what ingredients constitute a heartfelt apology so first like it said in the process resist the urge to say but so uh you know one of the things that i will tell my clients is anytime you say the word but you shit on everything you said before that so when you're giving an apology I don't want to hear you say, I'm sorry that I hurt your feelings, but you need to grow a thicker skin. Okay. Or something along those lines, right? Right. The reason why I'm laughing, I'm like, that, that, like that's a really good example because I'm like, wow, the second half of that sentence really just negates the first part. Like, Yep. And we've all heard those apologies, right? Uh, like where, uh, so Jeff's example of uh, hitting somebody with the cabinet, right? Um, hey, I'm sorry that I hit you, but you really need to get out of the way. Mm. Interesting. Mm. So what the second half does is it doesn't take ownership. It puts the responsibility on the other party. It does, which gets into our second ingredient, which is to focus on your actions and not the other person's response. So the way that this kind of happens um, in an apology is, uh, I'm sorry you feel that way. Or um, I'm sorry if you took what I said as offensive. So one of the other things that, um, that Dr. Lerner says is, don't say if, right? Um, I think that we have this, uh, cultural narrative of 
you know, and it, and it shows up a lot on social media uh, when you maybe mess up, uh, you know, hey, I'm sorry if you took that the wrong way. I'm sorry if you thought that what I said was offensive. No, what you said was offensive, right? You're putting the responsibility on me and my response rather than taking ownership for your actions. Mm-hmm. I think the word if is kind of debatable. Like I, I can understand why you wouldn't want it in there, but I'm reading it and I'm like, it doesn't change the deflection of responsibility, whether the word if is in there or not, in my opinion. Like, so in your example, I'm sorry you took what I said as offensive. But then you're still, if you, you're, you're putting them uh, in it, maybe a better way of, and I'm not even sure if it's even better, would be, I'm sorry I didn't mean to offend, which would be better, but I don't know if that's even sincere enough. Mm. I think sincerity is, is really difficult to gauge when it comes to apologies because I've seen many a time an individual who has been like, who is in the spotlight, quote unquote, as media, they're a celebrity of some sort and they do something and they put forth a public apology. And many a time they get criticized because they say something about, you know, I'm sorry for what I said or what I did. It was not my intent. But even just when I said it that way, like the voice tone doesn't really sound sincere. And that's where I think people criticize the individual who's apologizing. And then it becomes like this weird, like tit for tat kind of like back and forth thing. Cause then the person's like, well, I'm not responsible for how you construe my communication. You don't think I'm being authentic in this moment. Like they get, then they get like upset and defensive and I'm like, oh, not helping. <laughs> Well, yeah. So like, here's another example. So, uh, you know, Dr. Lerner will say that almost any apology that begins with I'm sorry if is a non-apology because the words become about the other person's reaction rather than about the apologizer's behavior. So uh, an example is I'm sorry if you were disappointed that I didn't write that email. Um, it, It it's about the other person, right? And about their mm. disappointment, not about the fact that like the the person just didn't write the email that they had agreed to do. Right, 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 right. Like I was thinking about how you could phrase that better. Like just taking out a few words. I'm sorry I didn't yeah. write that email. Yeah, right. I'm sorry I didn't write that email. Right. I'm sorry I failed to to meet my like responsibility to write an email, whatever. Yeah, that's rather formal, but <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, so something else, uh, another good ingredient uh, uh, ingredient is just uh, what I call kiss. Uh, keep it simple, stupid. Right. A lot of times, uh, apologies can get uh, overblown. They can get over you know, over grandized, uh, they can get, you know, sometimes they can even get minimized. Right. Um, so the, 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 the best course of action is to just keep it simple, right? Like, Hey, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, to go back to the process that we, that we talked about before, just stick to those four rules and you should be good. Okay. Um, also, uh, what, uh, Gary, what you were talking uh, about, correct your, be- correct your behavior. Say what you said that you're going to do, right? If you, uh, if 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 Gary and I went out to dinner three times in a row, and I paid every time, and at the end of the third time, I said, "Hey, Gary, you know I paid for dinner every single time." Uh, you know, Gary had the oppor- has an opportunity to say, "Hey, I'm really sorry that you have taken the the brunt of." the financial, you know, for dinner, I will pay for dinner these next three, these next three times. And if we go out to dinner the next time and I'm paying again, then he hasn't corrected his behavior. I have a lot of thoughts about this example just now. <laughs> I'm sorry. My first thought is, why are we going Dutch? No, <laughs> no my first thought is, 
Um, but what if I'm putting out? Like, does that make it sex for pay? Is that is that not okay? Like, have we have we made an agreement on this? Has there been contractual like discussion about it? Anyways, um, in addition to that, on the fourth dinner, if you decide to pay, this is going to be really hella awkward. That's on you, because I would expect you to call it out. Like, I would expect you to refuse to pay, or to like have a communication and discussion about it because you're an accomplished, educated adult. Do you know what I mean? And we're, we're friends. I would expect you to say something and be like, you know, when the server brings the check to be like, after we bullshit for another 45 minutes or however long, and you realize that I'm not paying any attention to the check or whatever, you could draw attention to it and be like, so. Girl. <laughs> girl, remember, so it's girl. your turn. <laughs> yeah, this bill is yours. Mm-hmm. something of that sort but no i mean your your point is taken to the example like you know that um i think the bigger thing is if there's something that is going on that needs to be discussed that's the key it needs to be discussed there has to be some communication about this and expecting someone to modify their behavior without communicating that to them is unrealistic Exactly. It's a huge amount of responsibility you're putting on the other person to be that self-aware, like that intuitive to know and to understand other things and to pick up on stuff. And they may be absent-minded. They may be preoccupied. They, there could be a whole plethora of, you know, all these variables, you know, uh, you know, 14 million plus opportunities of, of things going on that it's just not registering for them. Um, Alternatively, using a different example that was used earlier. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to write that email. Let me do that right now. I go write an email. Right. Exactly. So, uh, so the other one is to say consist- consistent. So like, you know, if, uh, if you've had a problem with this in the past, right, and you're correcting your behavior, making sure that you're being consistent with those behaviors. But like, I think it's also important to remember that we're human and we're going to mess up. So like, if, you know, say, to go back to the dinner example, right? So say, uh, you know, Gary, you and I talk about, okay, so you're going to pay next time. Um, but then like two days beforehand, you're like, Hey, listen, you know, money's really tight this time. Um, I can't, I can't afford dinner. How about we reschedule or, you know, you know, whatever, just kind of taking ownership for, for your part in your responsibility. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another one is to, uh, to intend to heal and not silence. And I love this one because uh, this reminds me of one of my favorite Ellen DeGeneres routines where she talks about how people will just apologize for everything, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, like, so you joke around with somebody, oh, did you get a new haircut? I hope you didn't pay for that thing. And then the other person's like, well, that was rude. And then they're like, well, sorry, right? (laughs) Um, but like the intention behind an apology should be to heal and not silence. So I feel like, or I don't feel like there sometimes is a, uh, an intentionality, intentionality with apologies to just silence the other person. Right. Uh, like, like Jeff, with your example, with, uh, kind of hitting somebody with a cabinet, right. Um, you know, you really, uh, that really hurt. Well, sorry. Right. Um, you, you don't really mean that you're sorry. You just want the other person to get off your back. Mm. Alternatively, to, to, to go with more healing is like, oh, I'm so sorry. I hate you. Are you OK? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there would be more that would continue from there, but. Right. So so, you know, the in, yeah, so the intention should be in order to heal the damage that was caused. Right. Not to just uh, clear yourself of the wrong of the wrongdoings. Um, and then also, like, do no harm. So. 
uh, like in recovery, we have this process of making amends, right? So, you know, one of the things that we say is that, like, do no harm with your amends, meaning that, like, if what you're going to say to the other person is going to harm them, uh, don't do that, right? Like, if you, uh, you know, some amends we just can't make in person because it would damage somebody, something, you know, whatever. So sometimes we have to make living amends, meaning that we just need to have corrected behavior from here and then. So, you know, sometimes we don't have to apologize for everything that we did. We just have to make sure that we kind of recognize the the harm that we caused. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, and then finally, like, I'm sorry, kind of like what we talked about is it's not just about, I'm sorry. I'm sorry is just a part of it. There's also the acknowledgement of the damage that was caused. Uh, and there's the responsibility that you need to take for your actions. So those are the ingredients of, of an apology. Um, how does that sound with the both of you? Any thoughts? I think that the key thing that I've like I was mentioning earlier is about the behavioral aspect, because I think we've kind of modified in the world and we've we're moving in a different direction as a society. And we're saying words are words. Actions speak louder. I need you to show me how you apologize, not just say something. So Mm -hmm. I I think that's I think that's pretty interesting. from that perspective. I agree. I think that the actions are a big part of it as well for me. Um, You know, I know that in the apologies that I have received in the past or, you know, in the um, apologies that I have given um, the, those relationships have grown stronger because I was consistent in my behaviors that I, said that I was going to do, right? Like I was going to be more consistent in people's lives. I was going to be more honest. I was going to be more open. I was going to, you know, do these laundry lists of things. But I also know that uh, sometimes we can over shoot our expectations, right? Like, so that's another thing. We don't want to over overdo it, right? And say that we're going to do something that we're not going to do. Right. It, it comes down to the concept of over-promising and under-delivering, under mm-hmm. which in, in companies that have deliverables, I guess is the way to put it, uh, whether it be a product or a service, there's a concept where it goes the opposite direction. It's like you under-promise and then over-deliver intentionally because you you say one thing. So you may say, for example, like, you know, your shipment will arrive in five to seven business days when in fact it arrives in like three to four business days. You know, the theory behind it being we delivered quicker than we said we were going to, and that would please the customer, hypothetically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so there was this quote by uh, by Dr. Lerner that I really liked, um, just to kind of wrap up our kind of ingredients, um, that if only our passion to understand others were as great as our passion to be understood – Were this so, all our apologies would be truly meaningful and healing. And what that, why that is impactful for me is I feel like oftentimes we want everybody to understand us, but we do not always give other people um, the time, the effort, the space in order to explain or understand them or for us to understand them. Um, and because of that, a lot of hurts stay there and we have a lot of miscommunication and misunderstandings. Um, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So that leads me into, uh, criticism. So when we're in the hot seat, um, that can be really difficult. So I don't know about you, but I 
don't always do great when I'm feeling criticized or I'm receiving feedback from somebody. So these are some things to consider when somebody is coming to you and saying, you hurt me, right? Um, this, you know, you, you didn't hit the mark here, right? So here are some things to consider. So first, it's very natural for us to get defensive. Uh, you know, we, that's, you know, it's, it's part of our DNA, right? Um, when, uh, when we're faced with the difficulty, our, our walls go up, right? Um, our fight, our fight or flight responses get activated. That is normal. The important thing to remember is, um, that's not helpful <laughs> in this moment, right? We're not going to be able to listen. So, uh, so I, I tell people to breathe, right? When we're breathing um, and we're taking deep breaths, we are allowing our ner nervous system to switch over from the fight or flight response to the relax um, state, uh, what we call the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest system. So take some deep breaths. Um, also listen only to understand, right? We're not listening to respond, we're listening to understand. Uh, and while we're listening, if there's any questions that we have about what the other person is saying that we do not understand, it is perfectly acceptable to say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm hearing you. What I want you to do, if you can, is um, just, you know, these are some questions that I have. Um, if you could, you know, let me know so I can gain some clarification. It's also really important in these situations to find something that you agree with, have some common ground. Um, there's usually some common ground, like um, saying like, hey, you know, I definitely agree that I should have paid for dinner last time, right? Like, hey, I really appreciate you bringing this up to me. Um, and that's when you can apologize for your part, right? Hey, I apologize that I didn't pay for dinner last time period, right? Let the offended party know um, that they have been heard, right? It's, I, I feel like saying things like, hey, I really appreciate you bringing, to, bringing this to my attention. Um, I, I hear you, right? Like these are all really important things that we can communicate during these times uh, to let the other person know that we're here with them. And the other part of that at the end of this is to let the other person know, you know what, I'm going to continue to think about our conversation today. I really appreciate this. You brought a lot of things to my, to my attention that I, I need to think about. And then finally, and, you know, also thank the other person for sharing their feelings because that's not easy. Uh, vulnerability, while it's very brave, it takes a lot of energy. So we want to let the other party know that we appreciate everything that they have said to us and also get some, get some vulnerability and bring the conversation up again in a, in a, a few days, right? Hey, listen, I, I wanted to let you know that I've been thinking about our conversation and I wanted to, to, to get some understanding about where you stand today, right? How are you feeling? Um, this is how I'm feeling what so some boundaries is for us is we don't have to take insults right so if we're talking to somebody and they are calling us names they're you know they're raking us across the coals we don't have to take that right and we can communicate that that with them hey listen you know i'm here for you i want to listen um but you're saying some things um, that are making it difficult for me to listen to you. If we could keep this conversation cordial, um, I would really appreciate it. Um, also, boundaries, right? Like, if if this isn't a good time for you to have this conversation, tell them, hey, listen, I really want to hear what you have to say. Now is not the best time. Um, can we uh, can we schedule some time later in the day? Um, and then also, uh, there is uh, there is this principle within relationship therapy that if your blood pressure, if your um, heart rate is over a hundred uh, beats per minute, you're not listening anymore. 
So if you recognize that you are at a place where you are checking, you know, you're maybe checking in with yourself and you're like, you know what, I'm, I, I need a break, right? Can we take a break? Um, can we resume this back in 15 minutes? I'd really appreciate it. I'm just going to go on a walk and I'll be right back. And then also um, finally like define your differences. So, you know, like um, I hear you when you say that you, uh, so Gary, you are upset with me because uh, you wanted me, you want me to pay for dinner, right? I'm really struggling with my finances right now and I'm not able to pay di uh, dinner right now. Um, is that okay? Right. So, you know, we may not be seeing everything from eye to eye. So, you know, when we talk about like, uh, like this is the area where we do understand, right? Like these are the things that we do agree upon, right? Let's, let's kind of define the areas where we're not agreeing on. So if we can do all those things, we can, um, we can have a, uh, a calm, cool, collected approach to receiving and delivering feedback or receiving feedback and delivering our response. So that was a lot. I, 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 I put notes in here about that, um, but uh, what do you think about that? It's interesting to me because having worked in prior to my current career, having worked in telecommunications for a long time, it's an interesting to listen to these steps, these things that you're talking about when it comes to criticism, because it's a craft, it's a skill to engage with another person who is criticizing you. And criticism comes in all sorts of different flavors and varieties. Um, a key one, especially when it comes to customer service, is you are being held accountable for something that is technically not your individual responsibility, but who you represent, the company at large, for whatever that thing is, the service or the product. The product was faulty, the service you know, was, you know, didn't meet expectation, whatever the case may be. And being able to understand the nuance or the difference between when someone's criticizing you personally and you as in the, the, you know, the bigger you as in the company overall. And I find it interesting because like one of the things is about drawing the line of insults. So that's one of the things that I just a corporate trainer was explained to people. Your job is not here to be insulted. So when they come at you personally, like that's where the line is being crossed. And then there are like professional steps to address that behaviorally with the individual um, in that moment. So I find it interesting, like looking over all this stuff and being like, mm hmm, like a lot of this is key factors in an effective way to communicate with another person um, what's happening in that in that moment. Um, yeah. What do you, what do you think the most difficult part of that is? Um, letting the other person know that they one that you hear them that you are truly listening to them and hear what they're saying. Um, the challenge or the difficulty, especially in, I would, this is obviously not the purpose of this topic, the show, there's a key difference between a business relationship and like a personal relationship. Cause in a business relationship, you don't often have a true bond with another person that represents the entity unless it's a smaller scale company you know, um, we in the U.S. we kind of refer to them as like mom and pop operations. So there's just a handful of individuals. So it's easy to like bond with another person or build a relationship with an individual. Once it goes beyond that, then you know the person you know that that handles your transaction at the drive-through, you're not probably likely to see them again. I mean, you could, but you'd have to build a habit. You know, like going to Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts or whatever your, you know, place of, of beverage preference is, you know, consistently on certain days at certain times to see the same face over and over again. Otherwise, it's just another random individual that you're interacting with. So the ability to reflect on what's happened as a criticism and then respond later becomes that much more challenging. 
because it's a it's a limited time opportunity. And sometimes it happens in our relationships. Like if you don't have a good bond with them um, and it's kind of transactional, the likelihood of, of you know, reengaging with that person is probably, you know, limited in that case. Mm hmm. I know that for me, uh, recognizing my defensiveness is the most difficult part for me because my initial reaction is to run away. Hmm. So like checking my defensiveness and to even verbalize it, right? Like, uh, Hey, you know, I can recognize that I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little defensive right now. Uh, you know, let me, I'm just, I just need to take a couple breaths. Right. Um, it's also important to kind of let the other person that you're talking about with kind of know where you're at right now. Right. Like, Hey, <laughs> you know, uh, I can feel myself getting heated. Right. Um, let's, let's take a break. Um, that's a difficult part for me. Uh, Jeff, what about you? I don't know. Uh, I think it's just about sincerity. Yeah. It, it's really hard to say. Okay. Because it, maybe it's because like for apologies to me it's seems basic like i have a really loud air conditioner i apologize about that <laughs> um i don't know also i think well, it can also mind though well i think it i think it also uh and we're gonna we're the actually that's a really good segue so uh so in talking about why people don't apologize, I think the the number one reason is people don't want to uh, don't want to admit the fact that they fucked up. So, right, I think accepting fault, which is another way to say um, owning your humanity, mm -hmm. like. Uh, and I'm trying to think of, of a different way to phrase this, like acknowledging your flawedness is, is very difficult for a lot of people because the ego gets in the way. Very we're, we're, we're very concerned about how other people perceive us, how they, you know, talk about us, how, you know, whatever they have to say about us could affect our future. Um, and, and while that's true, it is interesting because we live in such a, like a kind of a warped like society at this time, because we kind of revere people who don't give a shit. Like we, we criticize them at the same time. That's why I say it's warped. Like, you know, we look at somebody and be like, you know, they should really apologize for that, but they give no fucks. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? You know, yeah. they they um, walk with certainty through this world. And that's sort of revered in a way because they are strong and they are opinionated and they have such a, you know, a sense of themselves. And we kind of we collectively as a large group, like may be in awe of them and say, isn't that interesting how they, you know, so self-assured. Um, and yet at the same time, the, the individual can be criticized for that because they don't seem very compassionate or caring or concerned about others because they put themselves first. Mm hmm. Yeah. A lot of people have those personal views, right? That like they will, they don't apologize and they won't accept apologies from other people. Right. And I think that a risk of that is lack of intimate relationships. That's interesting. Like, I think of how over the years of my life, I have looked to certain women uh, in the entertainment as 
strong individuals and I've realized that there's a while some of them have opportunities and they reveal themselves to be vulnerable human beings like to be real there are others that while that's true like they are a real person they have such a consistency about them and their personality and their deliverable that I'm just like wow what a badass like just so self-assured yet critical but not like critical of themselves like they're so self-assured of themselves they're kind of like this is who i am this is what i do if you don't like it that's fine next (laughs) and i'm just kind of like wow that's really interesting because that has not been me in my life i have moments of that or other people have accused me of that when in fact that was not what was happening in the moment i was being aloof i was being withdrawn i was disassociated i you know and any of a random series of things because I wasn't authentically in the moment. I was like, my mind was off in seven different directions or whatever, and could not, could not perceive how I was being viewed by others. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's always an interesting blend of the situation. So I find it interesting that you talk about, you know, the people, the biggest issue about apologies or apologizing is that you have to accept that you're wrong or that you did something that hurt another individual or however that may be. Exactly. And so, uh, you know, specifically with why people don't apologize, I think family history and uh, relationship history comes into it. So like, and culture, right? So, you know, depending on where we come from um, and how we were taught, will impact um, the role that apologies play in our lives, right? So, you know, a lot of pe- a lot of times, like specifically with uh, victims of trauma, um, they will uh, they will have a history of hearing apologies over and over and over with no uh, with no corrective action that like it doesn't mean anything for them, or they were forced to apologize for things that they didn't need to apologize for. So it became like a, um, it became like abuse, um, like an apology was was used as an abuse tool, um, mm. and uh, so some people don't won't apologize because or some people will over apologize because of that, um, and then kind of like what I said before, some people because of their personal view of apologies um, and the apology process. Uh, they won't apologize either. Um, you know, could be ego driven, um, but that has impacts with the 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 intimacy, the level, the depth of the relationships that they have. Because I think that apologies are uh, are very important when it comes to trust, which we'll talk about. Um, and we talked the other time about, uh, like you know, a couple months ago about trust and how important it is. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, we're going to mess up. We're going to need to apologize to other people. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an unfortunate fact of life. Um, and, but those apologies help us deepen our relationships with others. Right. I, I think the, the personal like family history kind of stuff is huge when it comes to this because meeting another person's expectations is very, very difficult Mm -hmm. because if they don't express the expectation, how are you ever going to meet it? And even if you do express it, it, there's no guarantee. It's not an, and it's not an equal situation. It's not, it's not a input output all things being the same you know you're dealing with a living human being i i think of this sorry i was i was having a moment of of deciding whether or not to to talk about this so i'll say this my mother who has passed um we did not have the best of relationships uh as far as like from parent to child it had its moments where it was really good um beautiful and at other times more often than not, if I had to like graph it on a chart or something or equate it, I would say that it was not exactly the best. And 
what it came down to, I've come to realize as, as an adult who's aging is I had these expectations. I wanted my mother to be somebody other than my mother. Like a, a lot of the time I was looking for her to do things or to see things or to show her love to me in certain ways. And that wasn't how she was. And it wasn't until like the latter part of her life that I had an epiphany in a moment in which strangely I realized how vulnerable she was, but she wasn't telling me she was vulnerable. Like I had to observe it and come to this epiphany, this like this mind changing moment to say to myself, I have spent three plus decades of my life expecting this person to be something they are not. I expect them to do something a certain way and they are maybe not capable of that. And that really means it's on me. It's not on them. It's not fair to make a presumption about them and expect apologies from them for their behavior when they don't know one that I'm looking for that. And two, they, they're, they're not capable of it because right. we, because we'd have these like conversation disagreements, fights, um, you know, these verbal, uh, back and forth about certain things and this conversation today like as we're talking you were describing stuff that i was like this is really interesting how we're at a point now where that's not possible she is gone i'm never gonna get from her what i ever wanted and desired and in the last years of her life after i'd had this epiphany I found myself being much more warm and much more compassionate because I'd had this shift where I was just like, you cannot like, there were still moments. Don't get me wrong. There were times where I was like, woman, you're trying my patience. <laughs> <laughs> but what it came down to was, is it's like, is she really trying your patience? Or is this more just about how you're responding to like the stimulation, like to what's the circumstances to what's happening? And it was like, well, yeah, it's really that. Yeah. But the, the truth of the matter is, is that I wanted I wanted her to give something to me that was probably not in her capacity because of her family history, like her, her family history, which is technically my family history, but I wasn't there for it. And I learned of it later in life. I wasn't um, aware. I think I can speak kind of freely about this. My grandfather was an alcoholic. Um, I was emotionally abusive my understanding he was physically abusive against my grandmother and it created a very like strained family home life. Like to look back on it now, I could probably say distinctly that it was a home life in which there was like not only drama, but like trauma and, and like the eggshells like scenario of like satisfaction and like emotions and stuff like that. And it led to some constrained things that happened and, distance and all these different things and it wasn't ever fully resolved and what's unfortunate is like you know these are these happen in formidable forming years i don't think it's formidable um you know and in years in which you're trying to develop and be a person and you know and then eventually you go off and you become an adult and you know one of the one of the best things my father ever said to me that i still i will probably carry with me all the way to through my last breath is we didn't know how to be parents like nobody classically, my father said, nobody handed us a book and said, this is how you, this is how you are a parent to a child. He, he said, we did what we thought was best that we could in the moment with what we had. That's kind of paraphrasing, but you know, it's like that. And that was huge. Like that was mind blowing as an epiphany. I was, I think barely a teenager when he had first like kind of said that to me, my parents had divorced like uh, a year, couple years before that. And so like, it was a whole dynamic shift in seeing who these individuals are and now that i'm old enough by biological age to technically be a grandparent um i see this amongst my own group of friends who are close to me in age or a little older where we have these conversations about the difference in generations and how you were raised and things happen and um and that there's this this moment where your parents are no longer your parents that they are but in your mindset, how you view them, things have shifted. They're no longer the 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 all knowing, omnipotent like uh, guardian that has raised you, protected you, 
And when that happens, it can be a bit altering to to look at your parents and be like, you're just a person. Yeah. Like, what the hell? <laughs> you know, like, because you because you think of them and you're like, you know, they you for for quite a long time, unless. I, and I and this isn't fair. I'm, I'm speaking very broadly, and I know this isn't true for everybody. I realize it's a lot of apologizing and a lot of prefacing, but I want to own that. Like some people didn't have like the the upbringings that I'm referencing to. But your parents, at a certain point, you kind of have this like this moment where you're kind of like, you're just a human being. Like mm-hmm. like you're not a god. You're not a goddess. Like you're not a an omnipotent, all powerful individual. You're just doing the best that you can. And sometimes you're doing a shitty job. <laughs> But maybe you're doing a shitty job because you don't know any better, you know, like maybe maybe, you know, you're physically, emotionally, you know, abusive, like psychologically, spiritually, whatever. Because that's what you know. And until you know better, you can't do better, to quote my Angelou. Um, and, and so it becomes really, really challenging. And so I learned to not seek the apology that I was probably never going to get. And it was incumbent upon me to be okay with that. Like I had to Mm -hmm. sit with that and say to myself, I'm never going to get what I want out of this. Or I should, I should stop expecting something that isn't like is impossible or impractical. Um, And, you know, I was there with her when she passed and I didn't directly say this. I said a lot of things to her in the last moments, but I basically forgave her. Because that's what I felt was important, you know, and wanted her in that moment to know that if she could understand and like accept what I was saying, because I had no idea if she could or not. So I was kind of taking the moment as it was, but I realized I'm like, you know what? You are, you have permission to go and I will be okay because Mm -hmm. of everything that you've done for me. And that was like my way of saying, like, I've spent so many years in my life asking for you to apologize for the things that you've done when the reality is like, is that even fair of me? Because I had these expectations of you as a parent. I wanted you to be a certain thing. I wanted I wanted you to be a homemaker when, in fact, you were not. I mean, like there were all these things. Ooh, it's really turned into a therapy session. So <laughs> the the thing is, is that, you know, you you want these kind of things. But all of this stuff really impacts that, you know, Um Every person that you ever meet, that you ever interact with, in the moment that you meet them, they are bringing everything from their past with them. Whether it has been processed and fully developed, like a photograph in a dark room, and it's known to them, or it is not. And it's all underneath the surface, which affects their personality and their actions. And sometimes those things can can have an effect on you. So yeah, it's um it's really intriguing. So as we were saying. There are many reasons why people don't apologize. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and, you know, like what I was saying before about the gendering of apologies, um, I find that really interesting. And I've seen this happen. Um, and we know these these stories, but, you know, men aren't taught that or men are taught not to apologize and women are taught to over apologize. Men are taught that they deserve the space that they take up, and women are told that they need to apologize for the space that they take up, which is really sad. Mm -hmm. Um, A really good example that I have about this is when I was in grad school, there was one student um, uh, who was a woman, and uh, in in class, uh, you know, but when she would raise her hand, she'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Uh, and eventually... Uh, you know, me and uh, one, me and one of my other friends were like, "Yo, like we love what you have to say in class. Um, please uh, don't apologize for the for for the contributions that you made to this class. They're really important." Um, and that was really cool because you know, eventually they stopped apologizing. Um, but that's a really good example of how you know women are taught that they to apologize for everything where we have this, you know, me too movement, um, which is predicated on the fact that men take what they feel like is right to them. Um, and that they don't have to apologize or be accountable for any of their actions. 
um, which is really sad. Um, and that can have a negative uh, impact on on our relationships, especially heterosexual relationships, right? When you have men who are preconditioned not to apologize, um, and we have women who over apologize, that that doesn't always make the make a great recipe. It puts a lot of money in my pocket, though. I'll tell you that much. Um, but yeah, um, so. So those are some other reasons as to why, uh, you know, people don't apologize. And then also shame and guilt. Um, a lot of times people over apologize because they're uh, they have so much shame and they have so much guilt about um, about things like I know to for my own um, history, I just wanted everybody to love me. I didn't feel like I was worthy of anybody's love. Um, so I would just apologize for everything. Um, and it was, you know, it was definitely one of my, one of my faults. Um, because I just, you know, um, uh, I always thought people were mad at me. So I always thought that I, I needed to apologize for things that I didn't need to apologize for. Um, and that's that's what ended up like, you know, kind of destroying some of my relationships with people because I would take ownership for things that I didn't need to take ownership for. Mm. So it kind of it, it it's a um, it's a double edged sword. Um, so finally, like uh, a quote um, that I found uh, regarding this um, that I thought was really powerful says that when our identity and sense of worth are at risk of being diminished or annihilated, we will not be able to offer a true apology and face all that uh, all that all that. Wait, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. I, th I think I, I think I transcribed that incorrectly. Uh, we will not be able to offer a true apology and face all that the challenge of earning back trust entails. Oh, no, that makes sense. Sometimes it's just the way you say it. Yes, it absolutely. I've known to do that so many times, especially when I'm reading a... <laughs> but uh you know i think that that really talks about the fact that trust is the goal here um and that a lot of times people aren't willing to um to to lose their ego um in order to gain that trust back which is really sad yeah i think that's interesting that particular quote ed um especially the first part of it, I feel like it should be a sentence in and of itself. Um, and that's not a grammatical criticism. I'm just saying it's really profound to say about your identity and sense of worth being at risk to either being diminished to be less than or outright annihilated, like basically destroyed. Um, It's a really profound way to think about people's motivations. What drives them to, to make certain decisions. And the fact that, like, you know, a lot of times people don't want to apologize because they feel like it's going to kill them. If I say this, I feel like I'm I would be um, I would be giving you too much of me. Which, which I think also entails with how you feel about sincerity. Like, I can't really apologize to you because it wouldn't be sincere. Because you're angry or, or, or something where you're truly not actually sorry for something. Which can make things difficult. Yeah, I mean, I, 
I'm I've been very intrigued Ed, by that concept that someone feels it's giving too much of themselves. Because I, I feel like that speaks to so much <laughs> like well, about the person that they feel so protective of themselves that there's only so much they can give. And that's a that's a line they cannot cross. I mean, it speaks of vulnerability, right? Like in order right. to offer uh, an honest apology, you really have to get vulnerable. Uh, and a lot of times people are unable to get that vulnerable. And that also speaks back to the personal view. Sometimes people are not in a place where they can – that – what is it? What's the, the line? Uh, people will only go as deep as they are able to go with themselves, right? Like, um, like I often will tell people, like, you are mad at them for being who they are. Like, and we, we, we kind of just talked about this. Like, you're getting mad at the leopard for their spots, right? Like, they are only able to meet you at this place, um, and they can't go any further. And that's okay, right? That's just, who, that's just where they are right now. Um, so sometimes the, the, the responsibility is on us, kind of like what you were talking about with your mom, right? I can't expect an apology from somebody who, um, who isn't able to get that vulnerable in order to, um, to do that. And that's where our relationship is. That's where our trust lies, right? We're not going to have that level of, we're not going to have that intimate of a relationship because you're still in the shallow end. I think I found what you were referencing online. I was I was really interested in what you were saying, that kind of a reference. So there's um, what I found online. It says it's a quote by Matt Kahn. I don't know who that individual is. It says, remember, despite how open, peaceful, and loving you attempt to be, people can only meet you as deeply as they've met themselves. There you go. That's it. And I never heard that before. But it's really interesting because in the field of work that I do with public health and we talk about providing health and human services to people, one of the phrases that I regret as a catchphrase, I say it's a catchphrase because I hear it often. So maybe it's like a like I don't want to call it an earworm. It's of the now, um, but I really don't want it to be just the now. Like I, I think there's some some heft to it is you meet people where they are, not where you want them to be. Sure. So if an individual is, you know, lacking the skills or the abilities to get the resources that they need, one of the things we talk about is blaming the individual for not having the skills does nothing, <laughs> nothing to the positive. You know, you're not you're not giving them the opportunity to gain those skills if you're busy criticizing them or telling them that they are to blame for their own situation. Does not does not help. Right, because because you're holding them accountable to something that's impractical. It's it's similar to me how I have harped on this being a, having been a corporate trainer in a previous career. I cannot grade you on something that you didn't know you were supposed to know. So if I give you an assessment or a test in some way, expect you to have an answer to something, yet I never covered it, that's a failure on me as an educator, not a failure on you as a learner, because. That it's so like, I mean, it's to me, it's downright heinous to say to somebody, well, the reason why you missed that question is because you were supposed to know the answer. Never mind. I never went over it ever discussed it, referenced it, breezed over it. Nothing. <laughs> it's like, what? Because that's happened. Like, it's crazy how people will will make a measurement that's impractical of another person. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what this quote is basically saying is. Um, just because you were at this level at this moment, this, whatever you want to call it, personal evolution, ascension, you know, mindset, whatever, does it mean that other people are as well? It reminds me very much to, uh, a, 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 I don't know how else to phrase it, a former best friend of mine many years ago, 20 some years ago, we were having a conversation because I had this moment in my life where I was going to become a personal life coach and I was going to tour and sell books and I was going to be a motivational <laughs> speaker and I was going to do all these grand things. 
And my best friend had this amazing moment of levity and said to me, you realize some people don't want that, right? And I was like, what? This is a kitchen conversation. And, and, and literally, it's at the kitchen table at like three in the morning. Like, you know, we're, we're having one of these like late night long conversations that apparently I'm known for. Yeah. <laughs> but I said, what do you mean? And they were like, I don't know how to tell this to you. The world does not want your help. And I was like, uh, okay. Like, they were trying so hard to get me to understand, like, while this is valid, that this is the way you feel, and this is what you want to do, not everyone wants you to help them. Not everyone wants help. Not everyone sees themselves as having a need for your help. So until you get with that, you are going to struggle because you will consistently come from a certain place, which is kind of a privilege to be like, I'm here to help you. And the other person's going to be like, I don't want your fucking help. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you're gonna I'm be sorry. Like, how did you get in here? <laughs> <laughs> Those memes crack my ass up. <laughs> how ungrateful of you to not want breakfast in bed. What are with these questions? How did I get in your house? Like, who am I? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, I mean, it's like, no, I didn't ask for this. I don't know what the hell you're trying to do. But no, I mean, I thought it was really profound that they were that 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 was one moment I'll never forget where they basically laid it down. And they weren't mean about it. They were very sincere, but they were like, I don't think you understand that some people in the world just don't want to get better. They don't want to improve. They don't want to evolve. They don't want to change their situation. As bad as the situation may be from your outside perspective, it does not mean that they want to change it. Exactly. And I was like, what? It was, it yeah. was pretty profound. So I think, you know, like to kind of wrap up that section is that like, even though you deserve an apology, um, doesn't mean that you're going to get one. Mm. And that's that's a fact. And that's where the that's where we should like table and that's where forgiveness or we'll put it in quotations. Forgiveness um, comes in. Because I think forgiveness is culturally misdirected. And also a topic for another show. Well, that sounds to me like we're going to have more conversation about that in the next uh, part of the series. <laughs> yeah, that would that would be a good next part two. Foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah, because I um, I'm very intrigued by your by your comment about the cultural thing. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah. Um. I yeah, because like. You know, even with when I was thinking about the topic of forgiveness, I was like, I could wrap up forgiveness in one sentence. It's a perfect, it's a personal decision that is only for you. It's true. I think there's some people that would have a debate with that. It doesn't mean that they're, that you're right. Or wrong or that they're right or wrong but <laughs> well that's why that's why because i think that when we when we talk about it, we're talking about something else so that's why I, I would put forgiveness in quotes because i think that um like forgiveness for me like and in my kind of line of work it's literally just you saying okay i forgive you period move on mm. But there's more to the story. Leave that another show. And you know what? I think that's this show. Agreed. Well, uh, plenty ways to contact us. Pop over to our website, comes out loud .com. Shoot us an email, it comes out loud at gmail.com. Uh, leave us a voicemail. Tell us what you you think about uh, uh apologizing don't be sorry you can also follow us on social media outlets such as uh, facebook uh twitter tumblr youtube 
Uh, or you can join our entourage chat at tinyrail.com slash telegram dash col. Uh, you can also subscribe to our Google Calendar where you can see the names of these episodes show up and then change on the fly over at tinyrail.com slash calendar dash col. You can get various uh, accoutrements such as a Cubs Aloud shirt that Gary is wearing uh, at zazzle.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Uh, you can also become a patron at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. We appreciate your support, all you current patrons, and hope to see some of you people in the future. Uh, you can also uh, just send us a bit, bit of cash by going to paypal.me slash Cubs Out Loud. You can subscribe through us uh, through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, uh, Spotify, Amazon, and Audible. You can find me anywhere on the internet as Box Set, Box Puppy, Box Cub, Box, something or other, or Windgem, W Y N D G E M, on Twitch. Which, after this Wednesday and Thursday, my schedule for, for that is changing to Saturdays and Sundays. But wait, Jeff, you recorded this show on Sundays. Yes, you'll be able to get me through two different methods on Sundays. One, I'll be streaming on Twitch, and then you'll be able to find me here on YouTube later, or vice versa, depending on how, how we're arranging the schedule for that. Um, and while I'm doing that, you might even be able to watch another show over here on, on YouTube. I don't know if you're actually going to stream it, though, Gary. Uh, that remains to be seen. We're going to field test that. Okay. But that, that's for in the uh, coming weeks because my schedule is changing because I got a new role in my job. Yay! Oh, yay! Um, uh, so that's uh, some news for me. But again, that's uh, Windgem, W-Y-N-D-G-E-M on Twitch. Oh, Thursday night, uh, uh, Bears and Dragons will continue on Thursday nights. So after I get done with work. So. Gary. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as GareBear73. Um, I do have a Twitter uh, account. I have a couple of them, but the one that is uh, probably of most interest to this audience is GareBear73XXX. Um, it's a blend of things. It's mostly about my appreciation for for uh, physiology and sex, um, but there's also sometimes some political stuff in there. Uh, and some other things, but um, and I keep the drag stuff uh, sequestered to a different account for drag because spoilers, um, you know, during certain show seasons, <clears throat> which will be coming back very soon. So we'll discuss that more later. And Ed, as our illustrious guest, if people would like to find you online uh, to get in touch with you, what are the the methods, the ways? How would they do so? Sure. So, uh, so I have a, a few things. So you can find me on Facebook as Edward AC. Um, you can find me on Twitter at uh, either Eddie H. Cook or if you want that naughty stuff, um, Jeep Daddy 3. Um, just send me a message. Let me know who you are. I don't need clients or family members or whatever um, on there. Um also, I have a TikTok. Uh, it's um, you can find me on there as Unicub seventy nine, and um, what else? And then also on Instagram, I'm Unicub underscore Sex Brain Wizard. And you have a business, correct? Oh, and I have a business. Yes, you can find <laughs> me online at um, eactherapy dot com. Yay! Yay! And with that. Say good night, everybody. If I could click the button. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Ciao for now. Awesome.